everyone. Welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, to celebrate India's fine performance at the Olympics and uh, Independence Day, we at Bharata First have come up with an exciting offer for the Knowledge Center. Bharata First Knowledge Center is your one-stop destination for your competitive exams preparation. Go to kc.bharatafirst.com for more details. Use the coupon code FREEDOM30 for a great discount. Hundreds are thoroughly enjoying this whole new learning experience. Don't miss out. Be a part of this amazing journey today. Well, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and share the content as well. You can subscribe to our newsletter for some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs several quizzes. Please participate in them. If you like our content, do keep it alive by making a small contribution. All this information along with some must see recommendations are in the description of the video. Please go through it. And now on to the discussion. As global trade is revitalizing in the post-COVID-19 world with prices to ship containers from Asia to Europe skyrocketing and global logistics searching for alternative routes amid supply chain bottlenecks like the recent Suez Canal blockage, connectivity projects are gaining more momentum. One such project is uh, the International North-South Transport Corridor or INSTC, which connects India with Finland through Russia and Iran. The first train via the INSTC departed from Helsinki a few weeks ago, and it is said that it will reach uh, its destination twice as fast as the traditional route through the Suez Canal, proving INSTC to be timely and competitive. Beyond commercial benefits, however, INSTC also has major geopolitical implications. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the International North-South Transport Corridor. Join me on the program today are Ashok Sajjanhar, former ambassador, Shubhamoy Bhattacharji, consulting editor of the Business Standard, and Manjeev Puri, former ambassador as well. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Uh, ambassador Sajjanhar, let me start the program with you first. Quite a significant uh, development this, isn't it? I mean, the train is already on its way. It will reach India soon. Uh, what does this mean for transportation and what does this mean for connectivity? Yeah, you're right, Frank. I think it's a very significant development, particularly, you know, if you look at uh, how long it has taken for this to happen, for this really to take place uh, in uh, the real world. You know, we started talking about this in 2000. I remember I, I was in Moscow at that time and then we had said, we had decided the three countries actually, that was the Russian Federation, Iran, and India. And we said, uh, let's set this up, uh, International North-South Transport Corridor. It's going to cut down on time. It's going to cut down on uh, cost. It's going to cut down on uh, delivery schedules. And then it is going to sort of, you know, give a lot of impetus to uh, bilateral trade, productivity, employment, job growth, uh, exchange of goods and services, uh, not only between these three countries, but between a large number of other countries because this INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor, it was supposed to go right up to Europe. But uh, then we know what has happened in between, you know, as far as Iran is concerned, it has, for much of this period, it was a sort of a pariah state and uh, you know, there was nothing much that could be done uh, with it. So now that we have this uh, first train, as you said, happening, coming through, uh, and uh, it's taken all this time, there have been a large number of studies that have been conducted, which would suggest that as far as uh, the uh, cost is concerned, it will come down, you know, if we take the normal route via the, from the Arabian Sea, via the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean, going up right up to the north, you know, particularly as far as the northern ports of Europe are concerned, or the Nordic countries, or the northern part of uh, Russia is concerned. So it would uh, cut down the the uh, time uh, by anything uh, uh, up to 50% or so, and in terms of cost, it would come down by about 30%. So I think this is going to be a huge impetus. And over the period now, we have seen, in addition to these three countries which started, which really launched this uh, initiative, we have about 10 more countries which have joined. And more recently, we have seen with the coming uh, into play of uh, Chabahar, 
we've also seen Uzbekistan and we've seen Afghanistan also coming into the picture. So I think uh, this uh, first movement that is taking place, very significant, should be welcomed, needs to be applauded, but uh, going forward, I think the potential is uh, much greater, Frank. Absolutely. I'll just come back to that particular aspect about the potential and going forward, what's going to happen, because there's a whole new situation developing in, an Af in Afghanistan, and that's something that we need to take into consideration. But uh, before we go there, Shubhamai, let me come to you now. You know, the ambassador has spoken about how, uh, you know, the time is going to be cut short by 50 percent. And from an economic standpoint, considering the kind of countries that the train is going to be traversing through, what is the significance of this? Oh, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, it has to also looked at in terms of whether India has an ambition for expanding its trade. Uh, Indian economy, um, the expansion of trade hasn't been a very strong phenomena of our economy. Now, if you look at the trade data, we were about uh, $300 billion for several years. We are still around that. In fact, this is probably going to be the first year where we shall be actually be crossing 400, but that comes after several, almost more than a decade, in fact, even more. So what it essentially means is that you can have the train line and you want to have the connections, but if there is, but what do you put on that train? That would be a very important point. What are the products that India is going to take on from there, from these countries? And what are the products that India would want to sell to these countries? Now, that is something that would need to be really looked at. Uh, Indian companies, if you look at it uh, so far, have not particularly made Central Asia or um, beyond, even going up to, say, the European, right up to Finland, uh, too much of their spaces uh, where they are actually, um, uh, where they've actually set up a big market. So other than... Uh, oil and gas, which is, of course, always an interesting thing that can come along, but then there's a, that's a different issue altogether. Uh, this trade line would actually will have to be looked at in terms of what we are, uh, I mean, looking at as an ambition across that entire corridor. Mm, for instance, if you look at Chabahar, for instance, uh, from the Chabahar, of course, there have been a lot of restrictions, but Chabahar itself, uh, there have been, I mean, while well, there have been security geostrategic issues, but a large problem is also that uh, India hasn't uh, been a very strong, um, what I might should say, uh, user of that route. So whether if the train line comes to Bandar Abbas, uh, if it is not going to, to go through Pakistan, obviously, or, or if it comes to Chabahar, then we'll have to look at that, what are the things that we are planning to import into the Indian economy. And that would be a very strong, I think that is a question that has not often been asked and that is something uh, which needs to be thought through very carefully before, you know, such a multi-billion dollar investment uh, becomes something that we are really committed to. Uh, what Absolutely. is moving along on that line? Absolutely. I think that's a very valid point that you raised and, and you know, an important issue really. Ambassador Puri, let me come across to you now. You heard both the panelists, uh, both made some very valid points. And let's take this point made by uh, Shubhamoy forward. And I'd like to address, I'd like you to address that. You know, uh, what is it that we are going to put on the train and how much can we put on this freight train? So, uh, Frank, I must say, both of them made extremely valid and pertinent points, also looking at geopolitics, not just economics. So as Ambassador Sarjanar said, of course, we must welcome the idea. Not only is there good economics because it cuts down the distance. If you have land transport using railways, things tend to be cheaper and there is a great advantage to it. But Shubhama has made the very valid point. Look at India's trade and I'll look at exports more than anything else. We do about 30 plus billion dollars worth of exports to the United States, to the United Arab Emirates and to roughly China, Hong Kong put together. And then you have the European Union and it's not to northern countries. It is fundamentally to two or three countries in Europe, Germany, exports to Netherlands, exports to the UK, this kind of area. Now, you know, there is an old railway network which connects Russia with Europe and it's a very solid railway network. 
if this railway network gets connected to that, and I don't see any great problem for that, then up to Bandar Abbas, you have a train come. Now, I don't know what were the technical problems. I don't think there would have been issues of gauge, etc., because those are only typical of the Indian subcontinent. Everybody else uses standard gauge and there is no issue. I think your viewers should know one thing, that this train is not coming to India. This is a train to Iran. And after that, we have a sea link to India. If Pakistan didn't play truant, of course, you would have a train coming to India. And believe me, if they did that, Pakistan would be a big gainer simply through transit rights. But Pakistan has its own worldview and things which are even in its own interest, it doesn't do. But talking about uh, what Shubha mentioned, what is it that we would put on the train? Look, basically, we'd be able to put on the train and I'm going beyond Iran. We'd be able to put on the train things that we are exporting to Russia and some items of goods that are going to northern parts. It will take a little bit of time before we are able to extend this into Germany and so on and so forth. There is also another issue which we mustn't forget, which is the place of Iran in the economics world. As things stand today, I'm not sure many, many exporters who are exporting to Europe or beyond would be willing to take any kind of risk in sending things even to Bandara because they don't want to take this risk. They don't want to have anything to do with Iran in terms of the entire value chain, which is built up. So I think good idea, but it's an idea whose time will have to come. Absolutely. And now I'm very eager to hear what Ambassador Sajanar has to say, because I saw him very earnestly taking down notes and jotting down points with his pen and paper. <laughs> so the floor, floor is yours now, Ambassador Sajanar. <clears throat> Okay, so without a question, Frank, yes. Okay, let me put it this way. Number one, I think the question of uh, the different uh, railway gauges between uh, Russia and uh, Europe, it still plagues, uh, you know, these two geographies. Because uh, you would recall that even as far as the Second World War is concerned, the uh, Soviet Union at that time had got a different gauge for itself because it didn't want you know, that there should be possibility of uh, all these uh, soldiers and other forces coming into its own side. I still remember very vividly, you know, when we were in Moscow, even uh, uh, during our uh, tenure there in uh, the late 1990s. And we used to travel by train, what is, you know, called Krasna Strelka, that means the red arrow, which used to travel from Moscow to Finland. We had to, at the border between uh, the Russian Federation and uh, Finland, we had to wait for about two or three hours for the bogies to be lifted physically to be put on different uh, uh, tracks so that you know they could go and vice versa the other way so that definitely is a problem there the second aspect is uh, that uh, uh, you know there is uh, it's a multimodal uh, sort of a thing because when azerbaijan joined the idea was that uh, the uh, by road whether it is by train or it is by uh, trucks, because you know that whether it is in Russia or it is in Europe, their uh, transportation by trucks is very, very common. So it will come there up to Astrakhan. From Astrakhan, it will go by, uh, by uh, the Caspian Sea to Baku, and from there, it will find its way to Iran. So I think there are different uh, possibilities uh, there. The second thing is, that uh, Bandar Abbas, we have seen it is too crowded. It has become already overcrowded. And, you know, if you are trying to save time, then, of course, we have to go to some new port, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we have seen uh, happens to be now Chabahar. And you would recall that very recently when there was this meeting that was taking place, then our external affairs minister had also launched this idea that we have the Chabahar day so that, INSTC can be uh, uh, can be gelled with Chabahar, not only through uh, through uh, uh, Bandar Abbas. And I think that makes sense because, you know, you also have uh, uh, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. For them, Chabahar makes much better sense because Uzbekistan has also put in its road transportation from Termes to Herat. We have our own Zaranj Delaram road in Afghanistan. So all these will come. And of course, between uh, Rasht in uh, uh, Iran and Astara in uh, Azerbaijan, we are getting a railway link. So I think all these things are happening. 
My point here would be, you know, the last uh, point uh, possibly that I would make, or last two points that I would like to make here is, number one, it is, you know, what comes first? Is it the chicken or is it the egg? Do you need uh, better, uh, uh, good products, good volume and value of products for you to increase, uh, make the connectivity better? Or when connectivity gets better, then products will automatically come up Products are not coming in because we do not have uh, uh, we do not have uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, you would recall, even as far as Central Asia is concerned, you know that's our part of our extended neighborhood strategic considerations. Also, Afghanistan also strategic considerations, but we have not been able to make headway there basically because there is no contiguity as far as borders are concerned. The last point I would like to make here, I think what Subhamaya had mentioned that, uh, you know, we our exports are maybe just about 300 odd billion dollars out of a total GDP of uh, about uh, 3 trillion or so. That means just about 10 percent of the uh, GDP. Now, when we are looking at our 5 trillion dollar economy, whenever it uh, you know, comes, maybe not 2025, 26 or 27, we have one trillion dollars. That means about from 10 percent. We are, uh, it's our ambition and aspiration to increase the export to about 20%. Now, maybe that's a tall order, but I think the government definitely, in terms of the uh, uh, initiatives it has taken, the policies that it has put in place, whether it is the productivity linked incentive, whether it is the make in India, whether all the other uh, uh, ease of doing business, etc. We want to get more investment, we want to produce more, and we want to export more. So I think in that context, uh, we have to look upon this uh, positively, that uh, work upon it so that uh, connectivity routes are uh, uh, well established. You look at Russia, what is our bilateral trade? $10 billion, meaning it is uh, absolutely a pittance. You know what Manjeev said very rightly, you know, with the United States, we have about 45, 50 uh, uh, billion dollars as our exports, about uh, 30, 40 billion uh, dollars as our imports, total of about 90 billion dollars. But with Russia, which is much closer, we don't have that sort of a thing, again, for a variety of reasons. But in my view, connectivity is a lack of connectivity is an important element. And that is why we have also spoken about the Chennai Vladivostok route because that should also be able to help connectivity and hence economic engagement and partnership. Frank. Absolutely. Absolutely. Shubhamai, uh, talking about businesses now, you know, the G to G can be done only up to a level, certain extent. What about businesses? What about the private sector? How much would they want to use this route? How much would they want to invest in nations like, uh, you know, the Central, uh, Central Asian republics and beyond? And vice versa, how much would they like to bring in or bring to the table in India? Yeah, um, of course, um, is, um, if one wants to look at the positive thing, and I think I'd look at the positive thing instead of just being negative. Uh, the, I mean, I quite appreciate what Ambassador Sajjanhar is saying, and uh, I take on board what Ambassador Puri has also said about, uh, you know, there's uh, that uh, the potential needs to be grounded with realism. Uh, your question also is pushing on on the same direction that uh, what is it that the private sector would be willing to trade with this part of the world? Uh, Central Asia will take time to nurture. One of the reasons for that is Central Asia uh, is extremely rich in resources, but uh, very few nations, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, China, USA or even Europe, has been able to successfully tap the riches of Central Asia for uh, sustain other than you know exporting uh, even for exporting oil or for iron ore it's difficult for a variety of reasons as uh, Ambassador Sajjanar and uh, Ambassador Puri would be able to say even better uh, so that is I think we shouldn't be looking at so many stuff right now I would say that if fine if we are going to get the INSTC then let's first look at what can come from the terminal to the Indian terminal. That is in the sense that what can come from the Swedish, the Norwegian ports to India. And that is something where the trade volume is strong. 
and India has a strong amount of trade uh, since that is there. So those are the stuff which will be coming. They are also easier to navigate because the customs rules, the other rules are also fairly similar. So I suppose if these are, you know, sealed container trucks sort of stuff and they're traveling from one uh, from, say, Helsinki or uh, that sort of region they, and then coming over directly to India, then that's fine. I mean, that that's where the private sector would actually be looking at. Uh, in fact, as the I think uh, Mr. Puri pointed out, the, uh, the length comes down very sharply, the distance to Europe. So therefore, there would be an advantage which uh, some of the companies would be using. Uh, the use of the intermediate ports or the intermediate stations, I think we'll have to wait far longer. That's not something that we should be looking at at this stage. And, you know, given there are far too many complications at this stage to even try to, you know, think that we can, we can actually, uh, given the sensitivities involved, that we can actually try to do it. Now, for the private sector, one of the things that can easily happen is, again, uh, the usual stuff of automobiles. India actually import, exports a lot of stuff to Europe. Uh, cars, that's one of the things. There's also heavy engineering machinery, which goes both from that side and comes here. So again, as I say, these are all I'm focusing on what can come from the northern European countries. That's where the length of this uh, service would actually now show its utility. And if right. it can show utility, that is, I suppose, where we should be focusing on rather than trying to harness what can come from the intermediate station countries. I know that those countries are very keen because they are landlocked. They would want to get an access to the Indian market, Iranian market. But plenty of uh, you know stuff needs to be sorted out before we can actually reach those places. So at least for the first few initial years, I would say, uh, let's not even think that those places would be opened up beyond the odd uh, consignments here and there. And let's first look at establishing the end-to-end -end, uh, transaction. After that, one can then start looking at, you know, broader and be more ambitious. Yes, absolutely, right. absolutely. Ambassador Puri, coming back to you now, what about the turmoil? in the region and how much of an impact is all of that going to have on the uh, international north-south transport corridor and is it going to uh, you know kind of dampen the spirit so to say unmute please uh, frank i want to make a slightly different point and perhaps i may not agree with this word dampen the spirits and i'll tell you why for me the biggest problem here is multimodal it sounds a very good word, but actually it only adds costs and it adds time. There should be a direct train link to Bandar Abbas all the way from the Russian network. And that's what the Russians are supposed to do in this. Use the leverages of their being what they are, the hegemonistic power in that area, to be able to ensure that there is one line which delivers across. Then you can see aspects of this going into Europe and it becoming a worthwhile thing. Otherwise, I'm afraid it looks like, you know, one odd company has managed to fix it. It will be a kind of thing that we'll keep running around. Chabar, how much trade are you going to do with Afghanistan? You know, for a country of India's nature and game, either you become a very large exporter. And I think, you know, for all the optimism that Ambassador Sanjanar has mentioned, there is no real evidence of all that happening. And we'll have to see what happens. That you have opened these corridors is a good idea. Per se, it's a good thing. But I do think, I and I believe more than the Iranians, it's the Russians who, if they move and they make this, you know, not multimodal, but a single mode transport. So the only sea link is from India to Iran. And after that, it's a land route. That is what will make it cost effective and really worth it. And I personally think that if that happens, then the chances of turmoil, etc., affecting it are very unlikely, except for one business, the question of Iran and how the Western world looks at it. Because let us be very clear on one thing. It's one thing what Russia does with Iran. It's another thing what China does. We are not in that league and we really don't have those abilities. I mean, I can tell you, having dealt with this matters, that issues of payments vis-a-vis -vis Iran 
have been extremely problematic and there are no companies no banks no one in india who's really willing to build that cat whether we'll be able to do it or not i don't know that to my mind is really the critical element for several years to come the rest if the russians really put their bit into it then we should be able to see a situation where you have instituted an infrastructure corridor that has good potential and has economics at the end of it. absolutely absolutely all right time to get quick closing comments now from all my panelists with the best way forward starting first with you ambassador sajinhar well i think uh, we uh, need to reach out uh, this is uh, you know from the uh, this is the classical international north south transport corridor we need to get uh, the central asian countries we need to get uh, afghanistan also included into it meaning of course the violent situation the problematic the very rapidly evolving situation which is uh, doesn't uh, bode very well for afghanistan for the time being at least i think uh, that uh, uh, will have to be seen but otherwise as far as the central asian countries are concerned you know they might be in terms of population they might be quite small but they are quite prosperous countries you look at uh, uh, you look at uh, the uh, uh, kazakhstan for instance you know it has uh, a gdp of uh, more than about 240 billion dollars it's very you know the second highest reserves of uranium and uh, huge reserves of oil iron ore gas or everything and also uh, we have a very enlightened leadership now when uh, the new president shokat mirzaev he has come into position in 2000 december 2016 very many new initiatives that are being taken so i think uh, the central asian countries earlier on might not have you know when islam karimov was there for instance he might not have uh, given uh, too much of uh, possibility or good potential but as far as uh, this is concerned the current uh, situation is concerned you know for instance you look at uh, turkmenistan it is supplying about 40 billion cubic meters of gas to china every uh, uh, every year about uh, 40 to 50% of uh, oil of uh, kazakhstan which is in the range of about uh, 30 to 40 million tons is going to china so i think that our uh, energy is something uh, definitely but uh, india can definitely go through in terms of projects there is of course uh, uh, some hard work that will need to be done there is a huge information divide uh, between uh, you know these countries and india although uh, you know on the cultural level we have been uh, together but uh, what india can offer what they can offer i think we really need to work on that in a much uh, more uh, proactive manner and as i said the potential is uh, huge we will need to work it is not there you know available to us on a platter but it definitely is there and we need to exploit it and uh, uh, you know capitalize on it right. absolutely shubhamoy well i would say that these are very good ideas and uh, essentially you know build up step by step don't take too many risks initially by you know sort of bringing in all the countries bringing in all the all possibilities let's let's just say accept that you know only certain things can be exported or imported only from certain countries even if it that leads to a feeling of uh, you know being left out at the minute at the point let's let's live with that let's be a practical and realist and then build in more countries into the soup other instead of trying to be you know big friend uh, indian mar mm-hmm. like you know the classic non alignment uh, position i think that's 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 frankly taking too much of a risk in a region where there are too many great power rivals absolutely and uh, ambassador puri close the show for us with your concluding remarks uh thank you frank frank in my opinion this is a good development it's a good development because an other corridor a mode of transport gets open now its potentials are tremendous but in real terms it will need to be built gradually but we should welcome it and we should invest in it and what is the kind of investment that we should do i think first of all what is the kind of good shipping that we have between india and bandar abbas to start with let's have a look at that secondly that's something we can invest in and we need to take care of the economics of dealing with iran we need to understand that and build an infrastructure for doing that well 
secondly i personally think that if you can try and get the russians with perhaps the iranians to ensure that this is not multimodal from bandar abbas but it is a rail link all the way into europe then despite the gauge issues which ambassador sarjan art mentioned which you know are being licked, licked on a daily basis between the russian federation and the european country this can become something that companies will use and i quite agree with uh, mr bhattacharji that you know things such as ckds for cars for heavy machinery this would become greater and easily usable but the system needs to stabilize and for that if we look at some of these kinds of things and let me say invest diligently it's worth doing it because it gives you another option and it's economics which is good absolutely all right gentlemen we'll have to leave it at that thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us that's it for me see you again next time what's coming out of this discussion is that while the construction of the project has been progressing both technical and geopolitical factors have impeded its completion so far the main issue has been the slow pace of the development of the required infrastructure largely because of the absence of a driving political or financial force behind the INSTC unlike the belt and road initiative which has been pushed forward by china and supported by dedicated financial institutions INSTC is proceeding in an ad hoc manner without any long term strategy and is mostly financed by regional development banks or INST INSTC member states there are also bureaucratic and technical issues uh, such as inconsistent transportation laws insurance coverage security of cargo transit and others the viability in terms of items that will be put on the freight corridor is also something that needs to be looked into but all in all it's definitely a positive development and uh, we need to see how this goes forward because it is of great geopolitical and strategic importance well before i go let me once again inform you about bharata press knowledge center and to celebrate india's fine performance at the olympics and independence day that is coming up we at bharata first have come up with an exciting offer for the knowledge center it is your one stop destination for your competitive exams preparation so go to kc.bharatafirst.com for more details use the coupon code freedom30 for a great discount hundreds are thoroughly enjoying this whole new learning experience you don't miss out be a part of this amazing journey today well please like the video subscribe hit the bell icon and share the content as well you can subscribe to our newsletter for some incisive content the bharata first team runs several quizzes please participate in them if you like our content do keep it alive by making a small contribution all this information along with some must see recommendations are in the description of the video please go through it that's it for me see you again next time